Well, thank you so much, Daniel. I appreciate that. That was a great story. Boy, I, I love that. Did anybody ever tell you you look like the actor Jake Gyllenhaal? Uh, I think you do. I think you do. Anyway. Anyway. Um, hey, it's wonderful to be here. Um, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I um, uh, get to go some neat places, meet some neat people, have some interesting stories. Um, but earlier this year, uh, I was asked to return on Palm Sunday to my church, uh, my former church when we lived in Virginia Beach, Spring Branch Community Church. We went there. We loved that church when we lived in Virginia Beach. I now live in the Atlanta area. Um, so we were up there. Uh, I gave a, a seminar on the resurrection on uh, Saturday morning. So a bunch of people came to that. And then I spoke on the historical reliability of the Gospels on Palm Sunday for the, the services there. Well, Sunday night came. And so the pastor, Michael Simone, and his wife, Gail, invited my wife and I. She came up with me to, on that trip because she loved the church. And um, so they took us out to dinner, and we went to this wonderful Italian restaurant. Now, I don't know if you have Carabas up here. We have Carabas down in the States. Uh, it's like my favorite, but this was better. This was just whatever. I forgot the name. It's in Virginia Beach. It's just a fantastic. The, the food was just wonderful. So um, we're sitting there eating dinner, and so we're having this with, with Michael and Gail Simone. And uh, you can see my wife and I there on the right, Michael and Gail on the left. And at one point, uh, Michael leans forward and he said, let me ask you a question. Did, do you and Debbie, did, did, did two of you ever watch the television series Lost? How many of you seen Lost? Okay, a bunch of, yeah. I said, yeah, we did. We loved it. Uh, in fact, um, we didn't watch it when it was on. We waited till all the seasons were done. I think there were, what, eight seasons, something like that. And then we just, my wife and I had a lost marathon. We just loved it. It was just so much fun. And he said, do you remember the guy named John Locke on there, bald head guy who became the smoke monster or, um, later on? And I said, yeah, 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 we remember him. And he said, well, and he leaned forward a little bit more, and he says, he lives here in Virginia Beach, and don't turn around, but he's sitting right behind you. He's sitting in the booth behind you. I said, oh, that's pretty neat. Well, I'll just make a long story short. Within the next two minutes, I got my picture taken with him, and you can see him right there. So his name is Terry O'Quinn, and he does live in Virginia Beach, and uh, yeah, so I get to meet some neat people. Well not really meet them at times, but, um, <laughs> all right, so we're going to talk about did Jesus rise from the dead? Did he rise from the dead? Um, as, um, I was going to say Jake, <laughs> as Daniel just, he told us the reason why this question, did Jesus rise from the dead? Why is it so important? It's, it's very important. Um, there's not really much I can add to what he, he said here. I'm not going to, except I'm going to quote a few scriptures here. Um, well, Jesus predicted, as Daniel said, he predicted his resurrection. So if he did not rise from the dead, he was a false prophet, okay? But here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if the dead are not raised, meaning Christians, when, uh, you know, if, we're, if this life is all there is, and we're not going to be raised at the general resurrection when Jesus returns, if the dead are not raised, then Christ was not raised. And if Christ was not raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have died in Christ have perished. So if Jesus was not raised from the sin, there is no hope of eternal life, he said. You are still dead in your sins. You are still responsible for them. Um, and because Jesus was a false prophet, he didn't die for your sins. And those who have died as Christians are forever lost. You're never going to see them again. So things are pretty hopeless, Paul says, if Christ was not raised from the dead. Then he goes on later in the chapter and he says, If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. The dead are not raised. Why? Why Paul's saying, look, if this life is all there is, then why do I, why do all the apostles go out there and preach the gospel to our own harm? There's no benefit in it. 
So if we're not going to be raised, and this life is all there is, let's go out and party today. Cheat, get all the sex you want, get all the weed you want, get anything you want, live for today, get all the ice cream you want, because this life is all there is. Let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. The Christian life is not worth living if Christ was not raised. But Paul goes on and he says, if, but Christ was raised. So the argument is, if Christ, was, if, if Christ was not raised, the dead will not be raised. If the dead aren't going to be raised, this life is all there is, and the Christian life is not worth living. But, Paul goes on, Christ was raised, therefore we will be raised, therefore the Christian life is worth living. So it is so important, this, this topic. All right, so... What is our finest source for Jesus' resurrection? I'm going to cover that. And here's why. I only have a certain little amount of time here. All right, 45 minutes total. Um, when I was in grad school, writing a 20-page double-spaced paper with a few footnotes was a nightmare for me. It really was. Um, I, I just I didn't know how to, to do things that well. Um, Paul, where's Paul at? Is he in here? Paul, I couldn't get into Yale or Van I couldn't even spell MIT, much less get into a place <laughs> like that, you know? Um, so, right in, uh, that, that paper was, was difficult, but you know, when I was in my PhD work, doing my dissertation, um, and I was going through a, a period, a crisis of faith, doubt, this, my research had to, to do with my soul. And so I was just obsessed. Um, Richard Hayes, you know him, of course, he was my external reader, and um, he, he said I was obsessed. <laughs> and um, so my dissertation, the average dissertation, I don't know what it is at Vanderbilt, um, but it, usually I think in the US it's 60 to 80,000 words, is that about right? Um, Professor Hayes at Duke said they don't even accept anything over 80,000 words. My dissertation was about 255,000 words with 2,000 footnotes. And finally, my supervisor said, Mike, you got to start wrapping this thing up. <laughs> I was obsessed. And while I was doing the work, I was um, purposefully engaging in public debates with people like Elaine Pagels at Princeton and Bart Ehrman at UNC Chapel Hill and um, Shabir Ali. Uh, who lives in Toronto, probably the leading Muslim debater in the world. Is this me? No? Um, I don't know. So uh, uh, I was doing this because I wanted to subject my findings. Uh, I was trying to do peer-reviewed stuff too and, and articles in, in peer-reviewed journals. But I also wanted to subject these things publicly because I knew my opponents wouldn't want to be embarrassed and they're going to put their, their, their best foot forward. And so I wanted to get critical feedback. And you know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And before all my debates, I would be engaged in prayer for several months. And I'd say, God, if I'm wrong, I want to know. I don't, if you have to humiliate me, that's fine. I just want to know the truth and I want to follow it because I may only get one chance to, to get this right uh, with this life. Now, of course, if Buddhism or Hinduism is correct, I'm going to have many chances, right? <laughs> Um, but if Christianity or Judaism or Islam uh, is correct, I'm only going to get one chance at this. So I, I wanted to, to take this very seriously. And um, so I prepared seriously for the debates, and then I listened to the criticisms and, and, and all this. And uh, when needed, I, I adjusted my arguments if I felt that I was wrong on some things or had overstated things. So I was real serious about this. So I um, ended up doing this dissertation, but, but I, I can't... Um, now, some of you bought the book that resulted and it became even larger. It's like 285,000 words if you have the book. So I, I added to it afterward. Um, so I, I can't get all of that, the 700 and some pages, within 45 minutes. But I, I'm going to break this down and I'm going to try to make it really, really simple. So simple that even an American can understand. <laughs> all right? So. so Let's, let's do this, and I'm only going to consider our finest source for Jesus' resurrection. Now, some of you might think that that's the Gospels, the, uh, but it, it's not. 
Uh, Bart Ehrman, he's one of the guys that debated. We've debated, I think, five times. We're getting ready to debate a sixth time um, in February on the historical reliability of the Gospels. Um, we had a written debate on it last year, and in fact, you can read it right now. It's, uh, you go to thebestschools.org, thebestschools.org, and then you just go into the um, search and type in my last name, Licona, L-I-C-O-N-A, or you could put in his last name, Ehrman, E-H-R-M-A-N, and it will come up. It's a focused civil dialogue. It's rather lengthy. So um, you can read that and you can judge for yourself who won the debate, okay? Now, um, Ehrman, in our debates on the resurrection, he spent a lot of his time going after the Gospels and he gave five major objections. Um, and I, I called them the ABCs, Ds, and Es. A for authorship, he says, we have no idea who wrote the Gospels because they're anonymous in the original manuscripts. Um, now, we don't really know that they're anonymous because we don't have the original manuscripts and the oldest manuscripts of the Gospels we have have the author's name on it somewhere. But the titles as we see in our New Testaments, the Gospel according to Matthew, the Gospel according to Mark, Luke, John, that's not in our oldest manuscripts. And so he says these are anonymous, okay? And then, so he says we have no idea who wrote them. B, bias. He says we can't trust the Gospels because the authors are Christians and they were biased. In fact, John, he says, I am writing these things in order that you may believe. So he has an agenda behind it. He, it's propaganda, so that's given us even more reason why we should question what's being said. C is contradictions. He said, we, we can't really trust things. You know, these, these documents aren't consistent with one another. They contradict uh, one another on more things than they agree upon. D, dating. They're written between, the scholars generally think, 35 to 65 years after the events they purport to describe. And he says that's just too long, especially when you take memory into consideration. Even six months later, things can get corrupted. Um, so we really can't trust them because, again, 35 to 65 years, even before they started being written, it's an oral tradition. It's being passed around from one person to another person to another person, like the game of telephone, and it gets corrupted. And then fifth, I witness. He says, we really have no eyewitness um, who wrote the Gospels. Uh, John and Matthew, they weren't, they weren't the ones th who wrote them. And, we don't, and Mark and Luke don't even claim to be eyewitnesses, but they get their information from the eyewitness. So we don't even have eyewitnesses writing them, Ehrman says. So these are his five major objections to the Gospels. And these, uh, for me, it's like, I don't, I'm going to show you, I'm, I don't base my uh, I don't need the Gospels in order to show Jesus rose from the dead because I'm going to show you an even better source. Now, I don't really agree with Ehrman's objections. Um, I don't have time to address these here. Um, but I did, after that, I made up uh, uh, a lecture and started giving it. It was a very popular lecture called The ABCs, Ds and Es of defending the Gospels. And if you go to my website, risenjesus.com, you can watch that if you're interested, okay? So they're up there. And I address all five of those objections. All right, I don't have time, but I do wanna give you just a little bit of a teaser here. So he says, Ehrman says, we don't know who wrote the Gospels. It couldn't have been any of the eyewitnesses, any of the disciples, because we're talking about fishermen and they were illiterate, so they couldn't have written these biographies of Jesus. But is that, an, is that a legitimate uh, objection? And I don't, I don't think so, and here's why. Even the highly educated back then, um, who could write, they often used scribes, secretaries, or the technical term is amanuensis. They would use an amanuensis um, to do the writing for them. Cicero was one of the most highly educated people in the Roman world. Uh, many of you may not know this, but not only was he trained in philosophy and law uh, and great as a rhetorician, but he also became the most powerful person in Rome a few times for several years. And Cicero, on one occasion, we find in one of the letters uh, that he wrote, um, he wrote it to Tiro, his amanuensis, his secretary, his scribe. And he said that he had had a Antony, Antony and Cleopatra, Antony came over for dinner to Cicero's house or spent some time with him. And at one time he said, Cicero, read to me something. Read me something you've written. 
Cicero writes this letter to Tiro, his scribe, and he says, Tiro, Antony asked me if I would uh, read something to him, and I said, no, because Tiro isn't here, and he makes me sound so much better. <laughs> so here you have a really educated Roman, one of the, the best educated out there, and he's, he, he has a scribe who edits and does all this to make him sound better, all right? That's Cicero. Now, we've got, when we come to the New Testament, we also have Paul, and Paul is highly educated, and Paul, in a lot of his letters, he ends them saying, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, suggesting he did not write the rest with his own hand, so he had a scribe. And you say, okay, well, that's kind of interesting, but maybe the scribe just took diction from, from Paul. It's not evidence that he did some editing, and that's true. It could be that he did editing, it could be that he just did diction. Now let me ask you all something. What is the crown jewel of all of Paul's letters? Romans. Now you read Romans and you say, wow, this is a beautiful letter. It's really, really well constructed. You go to some of his other letters and they're, they're quite emotional. And, and Paul, um, he's, he goes off and rap. L listen, I, I've got ADD I suffer for, from. It's attention deficit squirrel. You know, it, it's, uh, um, and things, well, I, I think Paul had a ADD too. Because in a lot of his letters, his undisputed letters, he'll start on a subject and, he'll, and then he'll think of something and it's like, oh, that's kind of, and then he gets off on this rabbit trail on a different topic and sometimes he never comes back. All right, so, um, if only they'd had Concerta or Ridlin or Adderall on that day, Paul's letters might have looked a little different. So, but you've got Romans and he doesn't do that. Romans is like really well constructed. It's almost like someone else wrote it, you know? Well, when you come to the end, Romans chapter 16, verse 22, it says, I, Tertius, who, write, who wrote this letter, send you my greetings. Whoa. It's like Tertius, I can just imagine Paul saying, Tertius, you've traveled with me, you've heard my preaching, you know what I think on some things. Um, I want to cover this in my letter to the Rome, church at Rome, okay? So take some good notes here, boom, 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 boom. All right, Tertius, I want you to write this letter for me. Make it nice. And then so Tertius writes the letter, he gives it to Paul. Paul reads it and says, oh, Tertius, you make me sound so good. <laughs> it's like Cicero had his Tiro, Paul had his Tertius. Now, some of you um, are pretty young in here. You're going to get married. You're going to have kids. You're going to think of names. Just remember, Tertius. All right? <laughs> so, listen, what if, what if the gospel authors were illiterate? Uh, say, say John or Matthew were illiterate. Could they have used a scribe? Could we still have authorship. I'm not saying that Matthew, look, I know that Matthew and John are highly, highly, hotly disputed on who wrote them. Personally, I think John wrote John. I'm in a minority there. Um, but most scholars do believe that whoever wrote the gospel of John was either one of Jesus' disciples, perhaps a minor disciple, or whoever wrote it used one of Jesus' disciples as their primary uh, source. Like, for example, Dale Allison at uh, uh, thinks that, and he's at, uh, at Princeton. Not an evangelical, but a lot of, most Johannine scholars think that there is direct eyewitness testimony behind John's gospel. Matthew's a little more difficult, okay? But it's not like we have no idea who wrote these gospels. And the majority of scholars today, slight majority of scholars, do think that, uh, agree with the traditional authorship of Mark, that Mark knew the apostle Peter, and Peter was his primary source. And the majority of scholars today would say, uh, now I get this part from Craig Keener, who wrote this massive commentary on Acts, and uh, I mean, just massive. <laughs> and, um, and in there he talks about authorship, and he has actually done bean counting uh, with uh, scholars on uh, Luke Acts, and he says the, the slight majority of scholars do think that the author of Acts was a traveling companion of Paul, knew uh, several of the eyewitnesses. So, I mean, we've got some good testimony here. It's not like we have no idea who wrote them. Anyway, I need to, to move on. That's just a, a little bit. Now, uh, and if you want more on the ABCs, Ds, and Es, just go to my website and you can watch the entire lecture. All right, so our best source when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus is Paul.
He's our ace. And there's good reason for that. Let's give you a few here. Um, There are 13 letters of Paul in the New Testament, and of those, seven of them are considered by scholars to be undisputed. That is, it's undisputed that he wrote them. And uh, then there are six that are disputed hotly. And of those six, two of them are a slight majority would say Paul wrote them, and then there are four of them that the majority would say Paul did not write them. Now, I'm not commenting one way or the other on whether he wrote them. That's irrelevant for this talk. I don't want to get bogged down on that. But here's the thing. I'm only going to appeal to the undisputed letters of Paul here. So I'm going to use Paul, who is perhaps our earliest author in the New Testament, and I'm only going to use his undisputed letters. So that means a critic can't come back and say, oh, well, Paul didn't write that. Or the Gospels contradict when, all right, I'm not, I'm not doing the Gospels here. If you want to know about Gospel contradictions, I wrote a book just published by Oxford, and it's called Why Are There Differences in the Gospels? I, I deal with that kind of stuff, all right? But we're, we're just focusing on, we're asking the question, did Jesus rise from the dead? Not anything about the Gospels. I'm looking at Paul, who wrote before the Gospels, and I'm only appealing to his undisputed letters. All right, now, here's what we find in Galatians. It's one of those. This may have been the first piece, uh, the first letter in the New Testament. Maybe not. We don't know exactly when it was dated. It was either Galatians or 1 Thessalonians. And in Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, Paul says he's going up to the Jerusalem second time since his conversion, and he's meeting with the pillars of the church, he calls them. That's Peter, James, and John. And he says, I met with them, Because I wanted to run the gospel message, remember this, the gospel message, I wanted to run the gospel message past them to ensure that I had not been working in vain all these years. In other words, Paul wants to ensure that he's preaching the same gospel message they're preaching. Now, I I can just imagine this. He goes up there, and he wants to find out, and there's a knock on the door, Hey, uh, Peter, James, Paul, uh, John, Peter, James, John. Um, I mean, these are main apostles here. Peter, James, John. Uh, Paul's here. He wants to talk to you. Yeah, come on, bring him in. So he brings him in. Hey, guys, uh, look, I've been going around these years and preaching the gospel. I just, look, I just want to make sure I'm preaching what you're preaching, that I'm, I'm right on with this. All right, Paul, give it to us. So he gives it, lays it out, and so James says, James, like the head of the church, says, Paul, uh, just want you step out for a moment and let us talk, we, and then we'll call you in, in a minute. So he goes out of the room, and James says, well, Pete, what do you think? Well, James, sounds pretty good to me. All right. John, boy, what do you think? Yeah, he, he's pretty good. Yeah, I like it too. Hey, hey, you know Paul, he really, he's a strange character. Let's play with him a little bit. All right, let him in. So they let him in. Paul comes up. Paul's standing up in front of him. He's a little nervous. And James stands up, looks at Paul right in the eye. And he says, Paul, we've discussed it. And, um, well, you're good, bro. Keep up the good job, buddy. Fist bump. So this is Peter, this is Paul saying that Peter, James, and John, the three lead apostles in the Jerusalem church, confirmed that he was preaching the same gospel message they were preaching. Now, I'm a student of history, and I know that, you know, we're going to ask the question, why should we trust Paul in this? Maybe Paul was lying. Maybe Paul just made this up in order to, you know, be authoritative, to fake his authority in the church. So, as historians, we look for corroborating data, and we've got some. Did you know that some of the apostles had disciples of their own? Clement of Rome, Clement of Rome lived in the first century and he knew the apostle Peter. And then there's a guy named Polycarp. Again, you're going to have babies and stuff. Just remember Polycarp. That's another neat one. So Polycarp was a disciple of the apostle John. So it'd be interesting to see what these guys have to say about Paul, right? Because Peter and John were They were the three, Peter, James, and John. So you got Peter and John and their disciples, Clement and Polycarp. Let's see what they have to say about Paul. And they're writing after Paul's death, after Peter's death and and John's death. And let's just see what they say about Paul. 
Um, so it's interesting to note that Clement of Rome places Paul on par with his mentor Peter. That's pretty interesting. And um, he calls him the blessed Paul. And then you come to Polycarp, and Polycarp says that Paul accurately and reliably taught the message of truth. And then he quotes from Paul's letters and refers to them as part of the sacred scriptures. Now, these are not things that you would do if Paul was teaching heresy or had gone off track and was teaching something different than your mentors, Peter and John. But it's precisely the thing that you, kind of things that you would say if Paul had been telling the truth that when he met with Peter, James, and John, they certified that he was preaching the same gospel message they were preaching. I could, I could give you even more evidence, but I'm limited by time. But I would say this should su at least suffi suffice to suggest that when we hear Paul on the gospel message, I'm not saying here that we've proven that Paul, everything Paul preached is what they preached and they were all in agreement. I'm not saying that we can prove that, okay? But I'm saying that we've got enough evidence that strongly suggests that when we are hearing Paul on the gospel message, the essentials of the Christian faith, that we are likewise hearing the voice of the Jerusalem apostles. That's pretty cool. So that would mean, even if we didn't have the gospels at all, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if somehow we knew what this gospel message was that Paul was preaching, we would know what the disciples of Jesus had been preaching. Now, wouldn't it be great then if some archaeologists were digging around in Jerusalem or somewhere, Caesarea, and they found some lost letters of Paul? I mean, we don't have all Paul's letters. What we have in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, it's actually 2nd and 4th Corinthians. We're missing two of Paul's letters. We might be missing more. Paul talks about the letter to the church at Laodicea. And what? What's that? Um, so what if we discovered one of these letters? And what if in one of those letters, you know, Paul said something like, hey, I understand you were reading my, a copy of my letter that I sent to the church at Rome and you started arguing with one another about what I meant by predestination and election and I'd like to resolve that for you in this letter. That'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be great if in that lost letter that we found of Paul, he said, hey, I want to remind you all of the gospel message I preached to you. Man, that would be historical gold, wouldn't it? Because we could look at that if he provided the gospel message, we'd be able to say, hey, we can know for certain what the Jerusalem apostles were preaching regarding Jesus. Well, guess what? We don't have to wait for a lost letter. We've already got it. It's 1 Corinthians. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Paul says, hey, I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel message I preached to you. And now he's going to remind them of it. It's pretty cool. You know, Jesus is probably crucified in the year 30 or 33, and Paul establishes the church in Corinth around the year um, 49, and maybe shortly thereafter, 51 perhaps. Um, and then just a year or a couple of years after that, he writes 1 Corinthians to them, or actually what 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, what we call 1 Corinthians, but is actually 2 Corinthians. You know, he's writing that letter to them that we, that we have. And in that letter that he's writing, you know, within 25 years or less of the crucifixion of Jesus, he says, I want to remind you of the gospel message I preached to you. And just a few years before is when he appeared before those Jerusalem apostles and they certified this message being true around the year 49. So we're only talking about two, three, four, five years later. Now, here it is. He says, I delivered to you what I also received. Now those two terms, delivered and received, connote the imparting of oral tradition. Back then, probably only about 10% of the people were literate. Only 10% could read, and maybe only half of those could write. So they learned through oral tradition, and it wasn't like the game of telephone where you have an unimportant sentence given one time to children who quickly and playfully pass it along to one another in an uncontrolled manner. That's not how oral tradition worked. There's been a lot of work and scholarship done on oral tradition over the past 60-some years, and we've gone far beyond that. And, and this was very important stuff to them.
Um, I had a kindergarten teacher tell me once, I play the game of telephone with my kids and they get it all wrong. And so then I say to them, all right, we're gonna do this again. And this time you get it perfect or there's no recess. And they get it perfect every time. <laughs> Why? Because even five-year-olds can get it right when they're interested in it, when it becomes important to them. Well, for these people living under the iron hand of Rome, the hope of eternal life could not have been more important. They're hanging on every word of Jesus. There's so much I could say about oral tradition here, but I gotta move on. So Paul's saying uh, that here we have oral tradition, and Paul talks elsewhere how tradition, just like it was with the Jews of old, it was with the church that was domiciled in Jerusalem, that tradition came from Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church. So Paul is getting this on the authority from the, the Jerusalem apostles. I delivered to you, Corinthians, in the year 51, what I had also received from the Jerusalem leadership. And now we're about ready to get here an outline of the gospel message that he was preaching. Now this is small font, and I'll tell you why it is in a moment. It says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared. Now the reason this is a small font, because I wanted to see the format in which this appears. It's, it would be this way in Greek as well. This is called parallelism. And when you're talking oral tradition, there were things that, would, that they would incorporate, like chiasms and crea, parallelism, all these kinds of things in order to assist one in memorizing things. That's why Jesus used hyperbolic language at times. Unless you hate your father and mother and your closest family members, you can't be my disciple. If your eye causes you to lust, rip it out and throw it from you. We don't really forget those kinds of things, but that's hyperbolic shock language um, uh, to assist in memory. Well, so was parallelism, long, short, long, short. There's another suggesting, uh, thing that suggests to us it's oral tradition. And another thing is after this, he says, uh, whether it's I or they, the other apostles, this is what we preach and this is what you believe. And the Greek word he uses there for preach is kerugma, from which we have the word kerygma, which would sig uh, signify the formal public proclamation. This is formal, what is formally publicly proclaimed. Christ died, was buried, was raised, and he appeared. And then Paul lists some post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. He appeared to Peter, then to the 12, to more than 500 at one time, to James, to all the apostles, and then Paul adds his own name to the list. He says, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now we have three individual appearances here, we have three group appearances. He, Paul had met with Peter and James on at least two occasions, so he's getting this directly from them. He knew the 12 apostles. He, and he had appeared before them. Um, I don't know about the 500 at, at where he got that information probably from the apostles or maybe some people who would, uh, eyewitnesses who were there. We, we don't know, we don't have any other report of that. But he's getting this from the Jerusalem apostles, this tradition here. So you have three individual appearances, three group appearances. The group appearances are interesting and we'll get to them in a moment. But what do we learn through this? All right, I mentioned that already. Paul's our best source because he's hostile at the time of his conversion. He was out persecuting Christians. He was arresting them, throwing them into prison, and having them executed for being Christians. And then he became one by his own testimony in his undisputed letters. He became one when he, had an, when he experienced something that he was convinced was the risen of Jesus appearing to him and it radically transformed his life from being a persecutor of the church to one of its most able defenders. Now I can tell you, having studied the literature, that virtually 100% of all scholars who study the subject, whether they're Christian or Jewish or agnostic or atheist, would agree with everything I've said so far um, about Paul. They would agree with everything I've said so far. Um, they wouldn't agree that the risen Jesus appeared to him, but they would agree that Paul had an experience that convinced him 
Jesus had appeared to him after he had been raised from the dead and he converted to Christianity as a result. All right. And Paul later dies as a martyr by being beheaded just outside of Rome. Now, what do we learn through Paul? Jesus' disciples taught he was raised from the dead. Number two, Jesus' disciples taught Jesus appeared to individuals, to groups, to friends and foe alike. And three, Jesus' disciples intended for us to interpret the resurrection as an actual event. Why? Because Paul says if Christ was not raised, our faith is worthless. That makes no sense if we're to understand the resurrection in a metaphorical sense. Paul is basing our salvation, our future uh, time in heaven, ability to go there rather than just dying and becoming worm food and nothing else to remember. He's basing that on the historical event of Jesus' resurrection. If Christ is not raised, we're not gonna be raised. Let's party today because tomorrow we die. All right, so now what historians do is they say, let's take these facts. Now I haven't discussed any other facts. I'm just going into the facts that we have really, 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 really strong evidence and upon which virtually all scholars agree upon who study this. Uh, now, of course, there are gonna be some like a Richard Dawkins might not agree with some of these things, but he's not a scholar in this area. He's a scientist. So when it comes to history, he's just a layman. It'd be no different than me talking about science. So I'm talking about scholars in a relevant field. Um, and there are a lot of them. In fact, my mentor, one of my mentors, Gary Habermas, has been compiling a bibliography for some time now. And he said there's approximately 3,500 scholarly sources that have uh, been written, uh, journal articles and books written on the resurrection since 1975. That's over 80 a year. That means to stay current on where scholarship is with resurrection, you gotta be reading over 80 books and journal articles on it a year, every year. It's hard to stay current just on this, on where scholars are, but he's got this massive bibliography. Um, so the, the, the things I presented to you is where, where scholars are on this, uh, even aside from the Christians. Now, what about alternatives? What are the various hypotheses? How do they explain these facts we've talked about? What about legend and myth that developed over time? Well, that's problematic and here's why. There's just not enough time. The earliest Christians taught that Jesus rose from the dead. You say, well, urban legend develops very quickly. Yes, it does. But still, we can get this right back to the Jerusalem apostles that they were proclaiming Jesus' resurrection and appearances. So legend does not work. You can accuse them of something else, but legend doesn't work. What about deceit? Maybe the disciples were lying about this in order to save face, okay? Um, what about that? Is that possible? Well, anything's possible, but historians have to look at what's probable, okay? And it's very uh, unlikely that deceit was involved, and here's why. We've got numerous ancient sources that report that these disciples were willing to suffering, willing to suffer continuously, and even willing to die for their gospel proclamation, their conviction that Jesus had been raised from the dead. You have people like Luke, Tertullian, John, um, Dionysus of Corinth, Origen, Polycarp, Ignatius, Clement of Rome, or Clement, yeah, Clement of Rome, uh, to name some, and there are more. So, I mean, you, you got all these different ones that talk about these disciples willing to suffer continuously and willing to die um, for the gospel proclamation. Uh, you might have a few who are willing to do it, but all of them? And it's not like you just got shot back then. I mean, the Romans had some real interesting ways of killing people. Liars make poor martyrs, don't they? Um, you say, well, wait a minute. People of all different kinds of faiths, Muslims and Buddhists and Hindu, they're willing to, and, and even communists who are atheists for the most part, they're willing to die for their beliefs or even their lack of beliefs. So just because the disciples were willing to die for their beliefs doesn't mean that what they believe is true. I, I agreed. But what it shows is they, it, it, it shows that they're willing to suffer and die shows that they truly believed what they were suffering for was true. You don't have a Muslim jihadist who when they say, hey, strap a bomb on your back or go uh, run this truck over people and you're, you know, you're probably gonna get killed or locked up in prison for life. He, uh, the, the jihadist doesn't say, 
uh, well, let's think about this for a moment. You know, Muhammad's a false prophet. The Quran's not from God. And if I do this and kill these innocent people, I'll probably go to hell. Sign me up. You know, they're doing it because they believe it's true. So what this shows is that the disciples were not only proclaiming that Jesus had been raised and appeared to them, they really believed it. And by the way, there is a difference when a Muslim uh, jihadist dies for their faith today, or let's say one of the Christians they kill, uh, and that Christian dies as a martyr uh, by ISIS. For all they know, the Christian or Muslim, it, it may not be true. They've not seen these things. They're dying purely on, or they're dying for what they believe purely on faith and some, some evidence, okay, perhaps. But we can't be 100% certain. The disciples, on the other hand, they knew what they were suffering for. It was either true or false. And again, liars make poor martyrs. So I think there's good evidence that, you know, you're looking at, they had these experiences, and these experiences must have been something pretty impressive for them to do this. It, it wasn't deceit. What about hallucinations? Now, hallucinations was the most popular alternative hypothesis a little over 100 years ago, and it was abandoned for a long time, but in recent decades, it has come back in full force. In fact, today, it is probably the leading hypothesis offered by uh, skeptical scholars um, to account for these facts. All right, well, let's, let's consider this and say, is this, is this probable that something like this would happen? Well, hallucinations, they've learned a lot about them over the years and what they have found over the last 100 years with a lot of research done on hallucinations is they understand that hallucinations are private occurrences in the mind of an individual. It's a false sensory perception. You are perceiving something that isn't there. And there are multiple modes in which you could perceive a hallucination, like see something or hear something, smell something, taste something, have a sense of motion, have a sense of touch, have a sense of presence in the room, but, the, but they're all false sensory perceptions. Sometimes people will experience multiple mode hallucinations, like see and hear something. Um, but typically, the only people who experience in multiple modes are schizophrenics and people high on drugs. Other than that, Hallucinations are experienced in a single mode. The group most likely to experience a hallucination are senior adults bereaving the loss of a loved one. And only 7% of them experience a visual hallucination. So what about hallucinations with the risen Jesus? Well, number one, the percentage of percipients is too high. It's not 7%. He appeared to the 12, to, he appeared to all the apostles. That's 100%, right? And the fact that he appeared, that's visual. So the percentage of percipients is too high. Number two, you got group appearances. Group hallucinations are very unlikely, if not impossible. Why is that? Because hallucinations, again, are private occurrences in the mind of an individual. They're like dreams. I could not wake up my wife in the middle of the night and say, honey, I'm having a dream, I'm in Maui. Go back to sleep, join me in my dream, and let's have a free vacation can't do that, right? Now, she might go back to sleep and dream she's in Maui, but we're not going to wake up in the morning and have this discussion about this single dream that we had. Oh, Mike, when you were bodyboarding out there and that wave wiped you out, I felt so sorry for it. Yeah, man, that was rough, you know? That's not going to happen. I used to live in Virginia Beach. My family and I lived in Virginia Beach. We got to know a lot of the Navy SEALs because um, half of them are out there. And I'd ask them about their experience of becoming a SEAL. That's Hell Week. And they start Sunday night and they go all the way through Saturday around noon. And they only get three to five hours of sleep the entire week. Not a night, but for the entire week. It's very stressful. And, you know, most of them uh, drop out and only the, you know, a few of them make it. Um, well, I'd ask them about their experience, and a lot of them experienced hallucinations due to the sleep deprivation. One guy said he thought when they were doing this exercise called Around the World, they're in a raft, and they go way out there, and they circle this buoy and come in. And as they're doing that, one guy said he thought he saw an octopus come out of the water and wave at him. <laughs> Another guy said he thought he saw a train coming across the water and headed right toward them. And he told the other guys in the raft, and they said, there's no train out here. This is the Pacific Ocean. But it was so vivid to him that he rolled out of the raft, and they had to back up and get him. So... Hallucinations are not contagious, all right? 
Another guy said that he remember he didn't experience hallucinations, but he saw a guy in the raft swinging his paddle wildly, and he said, "What are you doing?" He said, "I'm I'm trying to hit the dolphins. They just keep jumping over this raft." <laughs> Did you uh, see the dolphins? No. Did anyone else? No. They were having their own hallucinations, you know. So hallucinations aren't contagious. They're not seen in, in, in groups. But yet, we've got three group appearances in this early report that comes from the Jerusalem apostles. He appeared to the 12, to more than 500 at one time, and to all the apostles. Not one, not two, even three group hallucinations, rare if not impossible. And yet, we got three of them reported. And then you got Paul. Paul. Paul's not grieving Jesus' death. Paul's glad Jesus is dead. Jesus would have been the last person in the universe that Paul would have wanted to see or expected to see, and yet he converted based on an appearance of what or experience he thought was the risen Jesus appearing to him. Put all these things together, and hallucination hypothesis is just a terrible hypothesis, and yet it's the most popular one by skeptical scholars today. And I didn't even mention the empty tomb because it's not one of those facts that virtually all scholars agree upon. About two-thirds of scholars agree on the empty tomb. Most of those are Christian. The other ones I've mentioned are agreed upon widely by a heterogeneous consensus of scholars today. All right, so I'm just basing on those. But if the tomb was empty, that would not explain the appearances, would it? Because the body would still be in, in there. Um, wouldn't explain an empty tomb. So you got all these, these problems with the hallucination hypothesis, and when at the end of the day, the only thing that really works is that Jesus rose from the dead. That's the only hypothesis that can explain these facts. So strongly evidenced, just from Paul. From Paul, we establish he's our earliest writer. He's an enemy who converts based on an experience he believes is the risen Jesus to him. And if someone doesn't accept the resurrection of Jesus, my question would be, explain Paul. Explain, remember, when we get to the Jerusalem apostles through Paul, explain the three group appearances. Explain the appearance to Peter. Explain the appearance to James, the skeptical half-brother of Jesus. What was it that all of these people experienced in individual and in group uh, uh, settings on all these different various occasions? They weren't group hallucinations. They weren't lying. It wasn't a legend, it wasn't a metaphor, all these things. You start to run out of all these different explanations and the only thing that really works is resurrection. That just gets me excited. As I mentioned to you earlier today, I have a tendency to doubt. It's an important thing, you know, your worldview and what you're gonna depend on for eternity and when you're going through difficult times in your life. What are, you, what are you relying on? Like this, this, this girl that Daniel mentioned who was involved in sex trafficking. Think of that kind of miserable life. What are you relying on? What are you, what, what are you depending on? What do you, who do you run to? She trusted because of the resurrection of Jesus. It transformed her life. It can transform yours. Because no matter what you're going through, if you just learned that you have stage four cancer, stomach cancer, like my friend Nabil Qureshi did a little over a year ago, died last month or two months ago. What ha it made such a difference to him because of the resurrection of Jesus. Because this life isn't all there is. You just lost your job. You just had a relationship blow up. If Jesus rose from the dead, this life is not all there is. It's just a testing ground. Eternal life is here to come. We can know God. That's cool stuff. And so I look at this and I see the evidence for the resurrection and it just pumps me up. You know, I look at that and say, man, that really helps me in my faith. So I hope it helps you in yours. And uh, God bless you guys. And let's see, we'll go to the next one now, right?